a rare treat for you this morning. I'm going to uh, let you in on the depths of my nerdiness. Um, while I have, all right. While I have many favorite shows on television, one of my all-time favorites from the time I was in high school remains Jeopardy. <laughs> Whenever you say Jeopardy. You have to say it was an exclamation point. It's in the title of the show, right? Uh, I say it with five, typically. Um, hey, Pastor, I watch Jeopardy. Are you calling me a nerd? Not at all. Um, save for the general excitement I get in testing my knowledge, here's why this Jeopardy watcher is a nerd. I can imitate Johnny's announcement of Alex Trebek pretty well. This is Jeopardy! Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you that most daily doubles are found in the $600 and $1,200 categories. I can also tell you that the last commercial break before Final Jeopardy is so long, it allows for a small nap. <laughs> and the music for Final Jeopardy begins in the key of C major and then modulates at 15 seconds to E flat major. In other words, I know the script. The characters and categories might change from night to night. One round, the players might do really well, when the next, they do horribly. But for the most part, I know what to expect each night. Now, maybe this is how the story is starting to feel to us. The characters change from week to week. Some do well, some don't. Some excel in their faithfulness, others never find it. But we're really starting to know the script. A pattern has developed. The lower story is getting kind of tiresome. We fail to live as God calls us to live. And then God sends some form of help in the form of judges, prophets, kings, or more prophets to remind Israel how relentlessly God loves them and calls them to love God in return by caring for their neighbors, serving God in God alone. Their lives should look different, and that difference will shine like a light to the other nations, so that they will come to know and recognize and worship God as well. Needless to say, this doesn't often go well. Last week we learned that Israel, the northern kingdom, ten of the twelve tribes of God's special nation, falls to Assyria as they deport thousands of Israelites to Assyria and beyond. Assyria then settles thousands of its own citizens in Israel. Over centuries in that northern kingdom, a new people formed, the Samaritans, future enemies of Judah, the southern kingdom, made up of the remaining two tribes of God's special nation, who will fall in our story today. The warnings were there, but most of the folks think it's a boy cries wolf type situation. On the evening of April 14th, radio operators at RMS Titanic received a message that they were heading toward a dangerous ice field. The operators were busy sending messages from Titanic's passengers back home, reporting on the great time they were all having on the world's most luxurious passenger ship. They even set aside the warning message so they could get through the long list of messages from their demanding passengers. Later that evening, a nearby radio operator from another ship also sent a message to the Titanic warning about that ice field. One of the Titanic's radio operators answered in Morse code, shut up, shut up, I'm busy. I think we all know the rest of the story. Over the course of years, Judah ignores the repeated warnings from prophets like Isaiah and is overtaken by Babylon. Though thousands are deported earlier, the year 586 B.C. represents the final destruction of Jerusalem, the holy capital, and the beloved temple, the dwelling place of God. Israel's been through some unspeakable tragedies, as we know, throughout the story. But their exile in Babylon is especially heart-wrenching. Why? Because God's nation is no longer in the promised land. It causes this epic crisis of faith. Does God break promises? This land was to be ours forever. Then the temple is destroyed. Where will God dwell? 
Where will we go to worship him? Yet another crisis presents itself for the people. How could God allow this to happen? Yet another crisis of faith. During the exile, Israel lives up to its name more than any other time in its history to this point. They wrestle with God. Judah is able to wrestle with God because unlike their northern counterparts, they are allowed to stay together, to retain their identity in some form, in some shape. Much of the Hebrew scriptures were written during this exile in an attempt to preserve the traditions. One of the most profound writing prophets during this time is Jeremiah. And he's actually there in the final days before Jerusalem is destroyed. And it's kind of God's last ditch effort to get Judah to repent, to turn from their ways. How would you like to be told before a new job, that before the first day, you're told no one will listen to you? That's exactly what happens to Jeremiah. And he objects initially like most of the prophets who are called do. I'm too young, God. I don't know how to speak. God's response, I will give you what you need to say. I will be with you. God has the final word. I think we can all find great resonance with Jeremiah in our own lives today. Often the way God has called us to live seems counter to our nature, to live for others and not ourselves. The way God has called us to live seems counter to culture, to live in a way that cuts so fiercely against the grain sometimes, to proclaim and live in a world of violence and war that hope and peace and joy and love will have the ultimate and final say. For most of our lives, it was given that the majority of people we'd encounter on a day-to-day -day basis were Christians, held similar beliefs to our own. Not as true anymore, as more and more leave and our churches across the country decline. We never really had to worry seriously about reaching others because they were already there. Not so much anymore. And I think we're starting to get a taste of the difficulties that Jeremiah and others faced in speaking to people that have little interest in listening. We're finding we don't know what to say. God, I'm too young. God, I'm, I'm too old. I, I'm not good at speaking in public. I will give you what you need to say. I will be with you. God has the final say with us too, if we allow God that word. If we've known what life with God can mean, how life with God has changed our lives, and how God can lead others in their own exile to a way of life and hope, how can we not tell them? How can we not share that good news? In these days, it requires more than just going up to someone on the street. It requires relationship. At least that's been my experience. A desire to sit and listen to someone else. And then the door is usually open for us to do the same. God, that's not me. It's just not me. I will give you what you need to say. I will be with you. Jeremiah's words don't work, though. And the people are taken into exile. And Jeremiah is filled with tremendous grief for what has happened. So much so that he becomes known as the weeping prophet. Here is another resonance to Jeremiah we should all feel today. He teaches us to lament to pause and to express our pain, sorrow, even anger. In one of my seminary courses, I learned that all of us are constantly grieving, whether we realize it or not. We grieve the loss of the way things were. We grieve the loss of loved ones, the loss of our mobility, the loss of a friend to a move or a new job, the loss of our health, the loss of something, no matter the size of the change that it brings. One thing we do not do well as a people is to lament and to honor our grief. We are too busy being productive that the idea of actively sitting and praying or resting for days or whenever we are overwhelmed makes us feel guilty or even weak. Jeremiah shows just the opposite to be true. Among his writings uh, is the book of Lamentations. We heard part of it this morning. It was the third part of the scripture that Sandy read. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. Can you picture Jeremiah wandering around the ghost town that Jerusalem had become? 
How like a widow is she, who was once great among the nations. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. There's even a moment when God is called out by the prophet. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Who among us has not asked that question of God at some point in our lives? I've had times in great moments of loss where I look up and say, Really, God? Really? And guess what? That's okay to do. It's okay to do that. It is lament. It is prayer. It is a release to the one who cares and knows and understands. Even God weeps with the prophet. I got stuck that week, or this week, as I read that verse, that God was even weeping for the people. And it is for love of them, his beloved, that God weeps. Now, look what happens in the midst of Jeremiah's lament, in the midst of his bitter sorrow. Did you catch it as Sandy was reading? In the midst of this lament, and wondering how God could have allowed such a thing to happen to Judah, Jeremiah is reminded of God's true character. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lament leads to clarity of mind and heart, and even, as I might say as I read these words, to a new understanding of God and a deeper, truer faith. Now, our lower stories are filled with so much confusion, so much sorrow and pain. I've often asked why, but I don't think that's necessarily the best question. We'll know why someday. But for now, I think a better question is how. How, in the midst of life's grief, will we get through it? Will we take another step? I think it is to turn to the one whose story never changes and has been made to know us, made known to us. To lean on the one who made us in heaven and earth and then to be that strong tower for someone else. This is exactly what Judah will learn to do as they draw together as a people and preserve their people's traditions in a way they've never done before until they find themselves home. Again. My heart feels heavy these days. I find I have to limit just how much news I consume for my own well-being and sanity. The suffering of the world is so profound. The suffering that many of us here are going through is so much as well. Just can we take a moment simply to offer the burdens of our hearts? to God. Can we do that today? Whether it's sadness or grief or even anger that we need to express. Let's take a moment in silent prayer to do just that. We say our bones are dry and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Thus saith the Lord, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. And I have done it, declares the Lord. God, we say thank you. Thank you.